Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to episode three of Spacewalk Podcast. We've got a handful of things I wanted to just kind of talk about. Some fun things like, of course, the total solar eclipse that, as I'm recording this, happened yesterday. It was super fun, super cool. Um, we also had the last launch of Delta IV Heavy, which I was unable to stream, which makes me really sad, but we'll talk a little bit about some fun things there. Uh, also, last week, uh, we had the, uh, the NASA LTV contracts, uh, which was really, I just want to touch on that quick. Again, not really trying to do news, but then lastly, we've got some really fun questions all revolving around one exciting topic, which is cameras on spacecraft. All right, let's get started. Okay, Spacewalk, episode three, exciting stuff. All right, so first off, uh, last week, as I'm recording this again, uh, NASA announced the LTVs, which is the Lunar Trained Vehicles. Um, it's a huge contract worth a potential 4.6 billion um, throughout a 10 year period. Um, it's a little bit confusing, and I, I probably need to just watch the entire press conference. I watched a good amount of it. Um, I, yeah, we were preparing for the Eclipse live stream, so I wasn't able to totally tune in as, as, as closely as I would have liked, but uh, at the end of the day, we did have three awardees for the first phase of this, which was Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost, and Venturi Astrolab. Um, and they basically were doing like a one year uh, feasibility task order, uh, and likely only one, as far as, as far as I understand it, only one will likely be awarded a full contract uh, going forward for the actual thing. but. 4.6 billion is a lot. That's more than SpaceX has been paid so far for the lunar lander. So the lunar rovers, uh, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a big contract, but it is obviously something that's really exciting because they are required to, you know, be able to operate for 10 years. That's pretty massive. That's, uh, that's a pretty tall order. And what's fun is there's just no real, like, requirements. NASA didn't say, hey, it has to operate for 10 years continually or it has to operate for, you know, or, you know, it has to look like this and, and be this heavy and do this thing. They basically are letting the companies completely make up their own designs and kind of fit within a certain realm. They have some considerations, but what's cool is they basically are saying like, you know, if a company wanted to do 10 rovers, one every year, you know, that lasted each one had a lifespan of one year. Uh, and if that fit their budget, you know, 10 like cheap rovers is one, like super expensive, like long-term rover that was gonna last 10 years. That's up to the companies to design and, and with this task order, what they're end, going to end up being able to kind of design their plans around. So that's, I thought that was really, really cool. Um, I love when NASA does stuff like this. Again, this is the beauty of commercial programs as opposed to doing um, a fixed price contract where, I mean, a cost plus contract where NASA is the, you know, the top down, like they come up with a design, it has to be perfect. It has to be able to, you know, like when JPL designs a rover, uh, they go all out because it's like, okay, if we mess this up, uh, you know, it's a lot more expensive to, to mess up a $2 billion rover. Um, so we just really got to nail it on the, on the get-go. So they come up with this like master plan that's amazing. And then uh, they basically say, all right, well, what's it going to cost? We'll just send us the bill and try to fit it within this budget. And often, as we know, um, those budgets, you know, so the time and the budget slip and NASA just has to foot the bill. So this is the other way around, where instead they're like, all right, here's kind of what we want. You tell us, you put some effort into the design process. You put some effort into the, uh, you know, what this actually will look like and, and do and the considerations there. And then, yeah, you, you tell us how much it's gonna cost and we will pay you exactly that much. So if you uh, come in under budget, then you make a profit. If you go in over budget, then you lose money. And that was your skin in the game. It's obviously a lot better way to do things. So I'll, I'll be following along with this as it gets a little bit more involved, but super exciting. So big con congratulations to those three companies. Very excited to hear that. Um, yeah, I thought that was awesome. The other big news, um, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying news, trying not to necessarily do news things, but these are three really big things that happened. And I just wanted to talk about it quick because I, I thought they were really fun. Uh, the other big one, obviously, as you may know, uh, if you don't know this, I, I was actually wondering this, is there anyone out there in the world that had no idea there was going to be a total solar eclipse that's just hanging out on their farm in the middle of Texas or something and all of a sudden they're like, wait, 
what on earth, you know, and all of a sudden it goes completely black, like, or someone just driving a semi truck or something that has no idea and then is trying very, very confused. But yeah, the rest of us, I'm sure listening to this, are fully aware of the fact that there was a total solar eclipse across the vast majority, a good swath of the United States. And I had the pleasure of uh, co-hosting a live stream with the Planetary Society and, uh, and their awesome cast of people, including Bill Nye, which, uh, you know, as a kid, that, that was uh, a high bar set for scientific literacy and scientific, um, you know, education. And I've always looked at, you know, especially his original, when I was a kid, what, what he did, I, that's always kind of in the back of my mind is the backbone of like, how do you make this stuff fun? Um, I think nowadays, you know, we, everyone's kind of gone their own way. And I, I think I would do, I do things a little differently than I think he does things now. Um, and that's great. I think uh, that's, that's important to have different styles and different voices for different things. And I, I'm excited to stick to my niche and I'm excited to really always just talk about the hardware. I try to avoid even talking about contracts and things gets iffy for me because it, it just always riles up feathers. I'm trying my hardest to never really rile up any feathers for anybody and just stick to the fun, exciting things that bond us and bring us together because I just don't think there's enough of that. But the point is that we had an awesome time. I had an amazing time uh, at the Eclipse Arama Fest that the Planetary Society threw on. And the reason I'm saying all this is because it was one of those moments where I felt like everyone was united, everyone was having a great time together. Um, and I don't know if it came across in our live stream or not, but we, you know, really just uh, the like community aspect of an event like that is so fun for me. It's so cool to see everyone like having these same emotions. Even when I remember at one point on the stage, right during the totality, uh, I don't remember who said it, but they, they all are, oh, I think it was Matt Kaplan of, of Planetary Radio goes, all right, let's try and be quiet now and let's listen for nature. And it, that lasted all but literally six seconds before everyone started hooting and hollering because we were getting a little bit more of a hole in the clouds and could see the totality with our own eyes really clearly. And that was amazing. That was so fun. I don't know. I had a great time. Um, yeah, and I hope that, again, it, uh, our live stream was awesome. I was so proud of our team. We, we pulled together. We brought Luna down, uh, I guess, up from, uh, you know, the southern tip of Texas. We drove, uh, the team drove Luna up to uh, Fredericksburg, which is a gorgeous little town. And we set up this awesome live stream. I was really proud of everyone. Uh, the team worked really hard, you know, <laughs> to set up and, and do an awesome job. I was a lot more passive on this one. Mary Liz took all the production uh, management roles over, which I... That's the whole reason she's like working is because th that's the thing that I hate the most is all the planning and coordinating of things. I just, I'm not very good at it. I, a lot of things slip me and I fall behind on those things and just don't think about certain things. And she's very task oriented and did just such a good job bringing the team together. Everyone knew exactly what they had to do. We set up in so little time and it was so smooth in general. Um, yeah, just so proud of that team. It's becoming a lot more well-oiled compared to like when I think about when we went from Artemis to Firefly and back, how stressed out and how things were just kind of thrown together because we had no choice and it was like tight time scales and how if we could do that all over again now, how much easier it'd be just because the team knows what they're doing. There's so many more people, so much more familiar with our streaming system and our Luna van. Sorry, I'm talking production, but I'm just gushing because it was so cool and I had a great time and uh, yeah, and it was fun to use Luna like that again. I think it was especially not stressful because we knew what dates this was going to happen on the calendar for literally years. You could plan this one day on happening as opposed to rocket launches, which you just, you can have in the calendar, but by the time you put it in the calendar, it's very likely to change and be another thing. So speaking of, that's my last little thing that I wanted to just touch on because I didn't end up getting to, able to stream it today because I'm traveling back from the eclipse was the, uh, the last launch of Delta IV Heavy. Took off today, right when I'm like, if it had scrubbed one more day, I would have been able to stream it. Um, yeah, so even though it was in my calendar, and even though it was something I wanted to do really, really bad, I, I tried to stream the, the first attempt, the first attempt of the last launch, <laughs> if that makes sense. But today it just was a no-go for me, sadly. And uh, I part of me just, a part of me really loves that rocket, the big Delta IV Heavy with its three orange, giant orange, you know, common core boosters and that big Delta Cryogenic second stage. It's just such 
an iconic rocket. It's like a rocket's rocket. And I don't know, I, a part of me is very, very sad to see it go because that's one of my fondest memories is watching that fly with the FT-1. And just the first time I really experienced a real rocket launch from like three and a half miles away, like five kilometers away, um, five and a half or whatever. It was, it was phenomenal. And I don't know, it's just, it's cool. It's a cool, big, old school rocket. And sadly, it's gone and it kind of marks the end of an era. Like there's not, SLS still has those same vibes. SLS will, will continue this big old school rocket vibe for me. Vulcan still gives me a little bit of that because it is a little bit more old school, but it has a little bit of, you know, new kid school skin in the game. And so it doesn't quite, I don't know, maybe I have to see a Vulcan in person to see if it still gives me that like retro vibe, um, that OG vibe. But it is at the same time, it is exciting because the next generation of rockets, you know, Vulcan included, is substantially less expensive um, than the Delta IV Heavy. And the Delta IV Heavy really um, was not, you know, it was... It was a very capable rocket, but it was insanely expensive. And, you know, we don't really know exactly, especially with like these NRO launches. We don't have exact prices, but it easily looks to be over $200 million, more like 300 and some reports up to $500 million per launch is what they could charge. We don't know. It's a complicated thing because it's the U.S. government and NRO and all that stuff. But yeah, that's changing. Vulcan will, I think, almost no matter what, be cheaper. Um, it has to be because it has to be able to compete with uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches. And, uh, and they're just, right now SpaceX is, control of that, is in control of that uh, price point just by being so competitive and by being able to undercut anybody if they want to. Um, I think they have a lot of margin um, that they can continue to go down cheaper if they need to. Um, but for now, why, why go any lower on price for them if they can get the money they're getting the money then uh it's just pure profit for spacex so um anyway delta four heavy you will be missed um that was a, a beautiful launch i saw tons of beautiful photos from the cape from like adam uh and and max out there at the cape i, I just saw a handful of incredible photos and I, I miss it i mean i'm sad that i couldn't at least stream it i would have even liked to go to that one if possible final send off of such an iconic rocket. So congratulations ULA on what looked like a beautiful launch and the end of an era and yeah, new things to come, which is Vulcan. Okay, coming up next, we're gonna talk about cameras on rockets and in space and specifically during live streams and stuff like that, uh, as you guys have a good string of questions about uh, some of the decisions and hardware on these rockets. Okay, our first question comes from uh, Tommy McCormick on Patreon. And uh, these are going to be all kind of linked, but I'll start with this one. Uh, talking about the camera views on IFT-3, so Starship's third flight test, were spectacular, and Starlink's connection exceeded expectations. I was wondering, since the camera's weight is insignificant for test flights, why doesn't SpaceX place cameras in every nook and cranny? I would as um, assume there could be a data limitation, but uh, I would think they could add a lot more cameras and dedicate satellites during the launch to provide as much bandwidth as needed. Uh, one on each flap, up and down, around the thrusters, more in the payload bay door. The more, better to collect data for improvements. Maybe they do have a lot more cameras and they just do not share them. Okay, so cameras. <laughs> I know those of us that are visual humans, that have eyesight, rely on our vision a lot. But honestly, cameras for uh, like anomaly reports and stuff actually aren't that great of an instrument. Like compared to all the other forms of data, that are on the rocket, cameras are probably one of the weakest, for most things, cameras are probably the weakest source of data. So when you have a pressure sensor on every little line and every, uh, you know, a valve motion sensor, a, you know, temperature pressure and all these other things on every tank, on everything, you can walk backwards through the data on, on any problem and pretty much figure it out based on all of those other parameters. And so, uh, it's easy to look at like, well, if there's an anomaly, now maybe, okay, now Starship re-entering, uh, I mean, even like inertial me uh, measurement units, you know, like, and gyros and all those things, there are certain orientations and things that you could, they could probably visually see what is starting to go wrong that might not show up on data. You know, if a flap started to have like a burn through or something, a camera might spot that where a sensor might not give you a very accurate reading, but 
for all of the main parts of a rocket launch, all of, and, and then you look at, at bandwidth. So um, traditionally, this is gonna help answer some of these other questions here in a second. But traditionally, you know, a rocket needs to use ground, the ground satellites to be able to provide data links. And they're, you know, they're, I don't know the uplink, but we'll, we'll make up a number. We'll just say it's two or three megabytes um, per second when it's pointed at a ground link station. I'm sure we could actually find those numbers. I probably should find those numbers. But when you're trying to send video data, even 1080 or, you know, 720, 1080, you, you really need close to five megabits per second in order to push 1080, 30 frames per second. Um, so anything less than that, so if your limitation is, well, we'll, we'll say it is five, then first you wanna prioritize all of your other data, every other form of data, all of your, you know, every, like literally thousand times a second you can have uh, data coming down from every sensor. And that's going to be a tiny packet of information. Like, you know, it's just ones and zeros. It's just a very small packet of information can give you hundreds or thousands of sensors information for one frame of video, right? And when you think about it that way, you go, oh man, I'd much rather have every single <laughs> sensor available, all of the data on all those sensors and all those valves and all those everything, um, than I would rather have on, you know, one frame of video. And of course, again, the resolution, it can actually be a lot more frequent. You can have, you know, hundreds or thousands of snapshots a second on those numbers, which can provide vital details as opposed to most camera systems are 30 to 60 frames per second. And uh, so, so now when you start to free up bandwidth and you're using Starlink, uh, the, that opens up a ton of possibilities. They could have, and they likely do actually have, dozens of cameras on Starship. Um, I'm surprised actually like the tank watchers, I, I haven't really ever seen a report on, on people like spying and spotting every single camera, but I'll bet there's tons on Starship. Um, I don't know if there's, you know, more than a dozen, a dozen or more, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a, there's a ton. And with, with the ability of Starlink, they do have the option of actually grabbing and downloading and sending multiple feeds of video. And they probably still likely have to ch pick and choose like which ones or with Starship, what they could be doing if they have a solid enough connection, um, an option would be, Hey, instead of like sending 24 cameras, you know, that each need, especially if we're doing 4K now, that would each need 20 megabits per second. You know, I, now we're talking about a lot of Star, Starlink uh, bandwidth. Instead, what they could do is they could have an onboard switcher. All of them could be recording data. And then the switcher, as long as you have a good connection to the switcher, um, they could literally see um, with low latency all of the different camera feeds and punch around on internal cameras while only really sending one true downlink. So you're, you'd have like a multi-view of here's all the cameras on board, that would be one like 1080 or 4K feed. You know, you need one of those per like 16 channels or whatever. So the, so the people on the ground would be able to actually choose the cameras on board. And that would be one way to, to get around some data limitations or you choose like four to six or eight or whatever cameras and each one of them is encoding and each one of them sending, you know, 10 to 20 megabits per second or, or five if it's 1080 or whatever. Again, I'm making up numbers. These are general bandwidth ideas. But the, the concept is, you know, if you have the, a big enough vehicle like Starship where, you know, switching camera views um, and, and manually switching and choosing for live streams and stuff like that, um, that's, that is potential when you have that much uplink. Um, when you, yeah, so if you have a ton of uplink, if that's like no limitation, say you have a gig up, sure, encode every single camera on board, send every single camera's feeds down to the ground via Starlink. If you're limited to 20, 30, 40, 50, you might send one or two, or you could actually potentially um, send just like the multi-view shots and then choose around on the ground and choose those views um, for the main feed. Sorry, I don't know if that makes that much sense, but, <laughs> but that's kind of what they could be doing. But again, th at the end of the day, honestly, the video is great for live streams. It's great for us. Uh, I'll, I'll say the word plebs. I don't know. I hope that's not <laughs> a bad word, but <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, but, you know, for those of us down here on the ground, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's important to us, but it's not really that important in the, at the end of the day. Um, we have another question from Patreon. Why does SpaceX coverage of the Falcon 9 launch switch to the camera from inside the interstage during separation of the second stage? The view of the two craft is much more interesting from the ground coverage. I think it's because it's actually really hard to see from the ground for a little bit. Like they'll say stage separation, 
and it just doesn't look like much is happening from certain, especially if it's flying more due east. If it's really like, you know, if it's a 51.6 degree north or, you know, a southern trajectory for a Starlink mission or something with a dog leg where it's, where it's hugging the coast more, stage separation is more obvious. But if it's looking right down the hatch on a more easterly trajectory, then, uh, then the view from the ground is actually really hard to see what's happening. And it could be confusing and it's kind of anticlimactic. The view inside clearly shows stage separation. Like there is, the second those stages separate, the, the light breaks through the, you know, the seams and boom, you know you have stage separation. You see it, it's very visual. I think they just cut to that because it's the best thing to represent stage separation. Um, I agree that the ground view is awesome. Uh, yeah, but I would like to see them kind of do it a few more times. I think they've only done it a handful of times that I recall. I remember that one, they switched to it soon after. Um, I, God, well, I think it was a transporter mission and it was just spectacular, but I don't know, maybe they don't rely on it and they just kind of have it default to that. That would kind of be my guess. Um, on that note, Simon uh, Anthony, also a Patreon member. Thank you so much, um, all three of you for your Patreon support. Uh, when every Falcon 9 launch booster stage is ejected, we see a split screen of the booster stage looking up at the, well, they say Raptor, but it's a Merlin engine about to fire from behind it. And as on the right hand side, we see the, the Merlin, I'll say correct again, saying the Merlin do its thing as it pulls away. A few minutes later, we see the camera view from inside the booster now showing nothing. Why? So why do they show the empty booster uh, that's looking up through the interstage of where the second stage was, that same shot, they often will show that camera. Why? Um, I think the main reason is oftentimes like you just get the sense of space. And so also during like a boost back burn and stuff, you get it, you, you sometimes do see the ground, you see a little bit of space, you get a sense of where the rocket is pointing in real time um, and relative to its, its flight trajectory. Um, you get a sense of it slowing down. If you look at clouds, it's crazy. You can actually watch it almost go backwards sometimes in that, in that view back up the upper stage. Uh, and then it, you know, it goes down. Sometimes they have that view looking down the grid fins and down the fuselage for the, the rest of the journey. But most of the time, if they're looking up, it's actually during that boost back burn. Sometimes they do look at the, at the engines during that too. But you know, I don't, I can't answer why they choose what they choose. I do know, um, I think this has been talked about before where there's actually um, a little bit of bandwidth limitation on Falcon 9. So it actually cycles automatically, specifically on the Merlin engine on the upper stage. It's cycling automatically like every five seconds from left to right or, you know, 180 degrees opposite sides of that stage. It's switching between the two cameras and that's a limitation. So they basically just programmed it to say, hey, this way we can at least see if there's like burn through or any problems with the engine. We can at least get, you know, two sources of data um, you know, another solution to that would be like if they had it at like 1080, 60i or something like interlaced cameras. And if we didn't care about it, they could just interlace every other frame from each side and then decode it later as two 1080s or something, uh, 30. But the reality is they're dealing with very limited uh, bandwidth when they're going through the ground stations, the ground tracking stations. And so they, yeah, they, they basically put it on this like carousel, which is flipping between the two shots. Boom, boom, boom you know, every five seconds or whatever. And you'll see that. And so again, there's those limitations, even on the booster, I'm sure there's considerations of like, okay, during this part, we can show this camera, but maybe they do have it now where there's a way to switch other views when it's looking down the grid fins and stuff like that. But that's, those are some of the limitations. Again, I'm not speaking specifics because I don't know the specifics of the system, but I'm pretty sure they do switch um, between the two. Uh, they have a few ways to do it, but some of the things are just automatic and a lot of those limitations will be removed with Starship because of its Starlink bandwidth. So pretty cool that the Starlink that they've been developing and deploying is helping to provide even better live streams. And we've been seeing this for years now with the drone ship finally having uh, awesome footage of landing every time thanks to Starlink. And they've really figured that out. They've really changed that game because of Starlink. Pretty amazing, um, incredible engineering. Huge shout out there to the engineers. And lastly, we just have a regular question on X that we found uh, because the Andy Horn 79 on, on X or Twitter used hashtag spacewalk podcast and asked this question, which relates to all this stuff. What causes the pulsing of the silver foil above the Merlin engine that we often see in SpaceX footage? So, you know, you'll notice like the big engine bell glowing red 
is see kind of that snail looking turbine exhaust manifold. And you'll see this like silver foil kind of flickering and pulsing and breathing almost during the launch. And what that is, is, you know, the, the rocket engine or the, the tanks are venting constantly. Like as, as they drain propellant, they're, you know, they have uh, helium or sometimes a, a nitrogen for nitrogen for roll thrusters too, uh, that provide that. And there's a lot of things venting. There's liquid, there's oxygen vent off as, as oxygen is, uh, you know, is used or as it boils off, it's being vented out certain ports. There's a lot of things actually happening that are being um, ejected oftentimes down the bottom of the, at the bottom of the stage that interact with that foil. And don't forget, just because uh, the crazy thing is even if a, like a little nozzle is pointing, you know, like 45 degrees away from that, that foil, because it's in the vacuum of space, the particles almost eject in all directions because a nozzle, unless a nozzle was infinitely long, uh, it will always end up in space basically as soon as it leaves the nozzle exit, basically going in all directions because of the pressure difference. So even if you have like a vacuum optimized nozzle at the nozzle exit, you'll have this huge, like <laughs> the, the exhaust will just basically go straight out the sides, um, 90 degrees from the sides of the nozzle. Um, so, so even if you have ports and stuff that are facing away from that foil, if it's within 90 degrees of the exit of it, it will still interact with it. And because, and just because it's in the vacuum of space and there's no atmosphere, what's happening is those particles, those molecules are still being ejected and still running into the foil and interacting with it. Um, and so it might look, it looks really weird. It almost looks like, well, why is it in the wind? Well, I mean, in some ways, those, those pulses, those, those breaths of, of, you know, as the ullage tanks are draining or as the roll thrusters are, because don't forget a single engine, it needs nitrogen, cold gas thrusters to maintain roll control and orientation. So they still have to have those be pulsing to, to maintain a perfect, that's probably what you're mostly seeing actually is the roll thrusters. And as a matter of fact, I feel like I actually asked Elon this once on Twitter way back in the day. And I'm pretty sure he said, yeah, roll the roll thrusters for the upper stage is mostly what's interacting. But you see, do see a bunch of stuff. You do see, you know, nitrogen, like build up solid chunks of nitrogen, solid chunks of potentially oxygen, ice, you know, building up on in certain areas. And uh, yeah, I, the roll control thrusters, I think are the main thing that are interacting kind of at random intervals just to maintain proper roll and orientation uh, during acceleration. So that's, uh, that's mostly what's interacting with that, that thermal foil there. Uh, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. I feel like I went on a, a pretty big rant there about foil. And yeah, but that's one of those fun things that you do see with those cameras. So yeah, again, in the future, I hope with these next Starship launches that we see even more camera options, we see even more fun, and I can't wait for Flight 3, uh, or 4, oh my gosh, Flight 4, holy crap, I'm losing track of time and space already, uh, but that is coming up, we think, already in May, so hopefully we see some better views even, and if the vehicle maintains orientation through re-entry, which we hope it does, then uh, Starlink should be even be able to provide perfect coverage all the way down, which is absolutely nuts. That's the main reason why they had the blackouts is because sometimes when it's rolling over during uh, re-entry, when it had no real control, no orientation control during re-entry of flight three, uh, Starlink, the Starlink receivers and, and dishes were facing the ground, facing earth and away from the Starlink satellites up in space. So hopefully it maintains better orientation on this next launch. And as it punches a hole in the plasma, wake as it has this big wake in the plasma um it should still be able to communicate with one of the 6,000 starlink satellites in the sky and maintain a, an uplink which is amazing uh big 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 valuable asset there so again spacex is kind of providing their own infrastructure which is pretty valuable so amazing uh we'll be working hard to, to get even better coverage yet for flight four uh i can't wait for that we've again kind of always tweaking always upgrading, got a lot of new things and even better tracking assets as always. And hopefully we have clear skies. We're just constantly pushing on our end to provide good coverage for you guys for that next one. And I hope you join us. So it's going to be super fun, but yeah, that's, that's going to do it. I think uh, for this episode, be sure. And if you guys have questions, use the hashtag uh, spacewalk podcast, all one word on any platform I've been searching around. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of trying to stick to kind of one topic like this and, and just kind of get them all out there at once. Uh, like I said, I did some news stuff a little bit here, not planning to always do news stuff, but 
Uh, oh, actually, holy crap, before I finish this, speaking of cameras in space, did you guys see that Starlink apparently has cameras on board that we've never really seen before that showed the path of totality um, during the eclipse. And it was absolutely incredible footage. Uh, the ISS also had a, sh a few shots of it as well, but the Starlink one is really cool because there's so many of them. Like, uh, it's just crazy that they could, you know, get such an awesome shot like that. Um, but that's just another one of those things that is really cool. So maybe we'll have to talk a little bit more about that, but that's cameras on, on rockets. So whatever questions you guys have, hashtag space pot, spacewalk podcast. And of course, for those of you that are supporters, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we have been prioritizing people on Patreon, um, X subscribers and YouTube members, but mostly honestly, Patreon, we have the, the biggest group there. So it's the easiest to, to look through there and and catch um, things there. So Patreon is still preferred. If you want to support the work that we do here at Everyday Astronaut and, and Spacewalk, uh, go over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut and get your questions on air. But that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Thanks for joining me on this spacewalk.